and I have got Dr. Tina Moore on today, and I'm so excited. Um, one of our mutual contacts introduced us, and we really don't know each other that well, but she's just one of those people that you meet, and you're like, she's cool. I know <laughs> we will be friends, and so um, so we've kind of seen each other in our circles, but today, along with you, I'm going to be getting to know her, um, and I should have your professional bio. I so apologize, Tina. I don't okay. have that up here. <laughs> let's do this. I would love to have you kind of tell your story because you've got a really diverse background and some of the stuff you used to do and then do now. And I'd love to go back because I always like to know how people get into the space they're in. So tell us a little bit about your story, what you do and how you got into it. All right. Well, first, thanks for having me, Jill. This is super fun. And I've always been a fan of yours. And I'm just ex I was excited when Daphne connected us. Um, so what do I do? I, my background is in regenerative injection therapies. I was doing prolotherapy and PRP and stem cell procedures many, many years before it was cool. Decades <laughs> before it was cool. I was working with my mentor, a naturopathic physician. Um, I became a naturopathic physician. I'm also a chiropractor. So I love hands-on medicine and I love training other doctors and how to do it. And so my practice was predominantly around that, autoimmune disease, um, autoimmune driven pain, which is really common, and just kind of that whole circle, bioidentical hormones, kind of that whole world for a while. And then I started into the digital and online marketing space, and I really loved it. And I now coach other doctors on how to do that in their business and how to drive business into their brick and mortar. And really just, I, I believe every business should be skilled to some degree in how to function in the online space, right? And then uh, also teaching other doctors how to do the regenerative therapies that I've been so successful at. So that's kind of where I'm at now. That's amazing. And I love how you went from, you know, doing it, having the uh, clients and all that, but then also teaching. I know for me, that's been a space that I've moved into. And it's interesting because I feel like I can only make so much impact one-on-one -on -one with patients, right? Mm -hmm. So then to make a bigger impact, like today, I, you mentioned, I just got off a lecture with the um, IFM conference and it was so fun. I think we had about 300 attendees for that particular lecture. And I was like, wow, because each of them that hear this lecture, then they're impacted in their practice and their patients. So really, maybe I reach tens of thousands of people with that yes. small lecture. It's so much fun to make an impact like that. So I totally get it. Now, first of all, I want to hear a little bit more about regenerative what you've done. Again, I know that's more your past, but you're still teaching that. So um, let's go into that. And then after that, I want to talk about the online space, because whether you are listening and you're just layperson, mother, um, you're at home, or you're a practitioner, we have a lot of practitioners that listen. I think this is relevant because especially nowadays, we don't always have a face-to-face -face present with the pandemic, how it's changed. So this is critical information more than ever. Let's go back though to PRP, regenerative medicine. Was there anything that drew you that direction versus just a classical chiropractic or naturopathic uh, practice? Yeah. So my mentor, Dr. Rick Marinelli, he's the one who brought regenerative medicine to our profession many decades ago. And I was fortunate enough to spend almost 20 years working with him. I was his, I started as his receptionist. I didn't even wow. know what naturopathic medicine was. I just was his receptionist and his assistant. And from there, it kind of took off uh, really fascinating. You know, prolotherapy is the original regenerative injection therapy, and it's not as popular now. It's hard to do. It's very palpation based. It takes a pretty high skill set, to be honest, and to do it well. Um, and I just fell in love with it because I love working with my hands, anything I can do. I, I think humans were built to work with their hands. And so it was always very rewarding to see the results that he was getting and and it was at a price point that people could afford. And since then, it's kind of gotten crazy and people are doing these really elaborate, expensive stem cell procedures, which I do believe in some cases are necessary, but we've forgotten so much of these less expensive, really elegant treatments. And so that's really my passion. I have a, a mastermind where I teach doctors how to do prolotherapy and then also the digital and online marketing piece to bring it all together to have a really successful, thriving, cash-based regenerative practice. And um, I still do it. I still see a couple of patients here and there, but for the most part, you know, I spent my life as a really sick kid. And then I worked all of my undergrad in the hospital setting. And then I went to work for Dr. Marinelli right out of college. And I realized when I was 10 years into practice that I had spent my entire life virtually in a clinic of some sort. And I was like, I just want to know what life is like outside of a clinic. And so I did. And it's been great. Uh, gosh, I love that. And so for, for people listening, prolotherapy, I know what that is, but I'd love for you to kind of explain to someone who has never heard of prolotherapy, what is that? How does it in, induce the body's healing mechanism? Tell us a little bit about prolotherapy. 
Yeah, it's awesome. It's sugar water, if you can believe it. It's not anything terribly fancy. It's about how it's applied. And so the idea behind it is that ligaments and tendons have a really poor blood supply. So anyone who's ever sprained an ankle knows it, it can be a really grueling healing process. Um, inside the joint, we have a different set of cells called chondrocytes that build your cartilage. All of those cells respond when you hit them with dextrose. And so they respond in sort of a modulated uh, inflammatory fashion, if you will, not to, you know, be too technical, but really just, it's the idea of waking the body up around that joint and getting it to heal. It's a secondary chance at healing. And it works very well, depending on who your technician is. It's not just about shooting some juice in the joint. It's about treating all of the involved structures around that joint. It works very well to cut pain. It works very well to regenerate and give stability to the joint. If it's not strong enough, we can easily just go up the ladder. We can jump up to PRP. There's more expensive and fancier things to put in the syringe, but the technique's the same. You want to treat comprehensively whatever joint you're dealing with. Got it. And what I love what you're saying there, and I want to clarify for the people listening, like inflammation, that's interesting because people think inflammation is all bad, right? Like we're always anti-inflammatories, take this, take that. So the opposite of that would be like, take a ibuprofen for reducing inflammation. And we think of that as pain control, but the truth is that bodies, our body's process of creating cells that go to the place of, of damage um, which is, quote, inflammation, is actually our body's way of healing that place, right? So we're actually recruiting more cells to go in and do the work of repair and recovery. Is that right? Is that another way? Correct. To say? Yeah. Yep. Yep. So it's, a, it's just a wonderful way to give the body that chance because most people do take ibuprofen when they get hurt, which completely, as you know, obliterates yeah. that inflammatory cascade, which totally ruins their chances at building new collagen. 300 days later. So you're kind of shooting yourself in the foot when you ice it and ibuprofen it. Gosh, couldn't agree more. So I love that we're talking about this because this is practical stuff for people, you know, in healing. Same thing as if you get a fever with a, a, you know, viral illness. I'm a big fan of as long as that is controlled and not above a certain temperature um, and you're safe and you're not like having a seizure, it's yep. not a bad idea to let that fever go. And again, you as a naturopath, you guys are way ahead of the game, at, you know, compared to us allopathic doctors because you for years taught that fever, you let it ride, right? Would you agree with that? Oh yeah. I tell people to let it burn until they hit a certain point. And then we, and, and that point's different for each person. And it, you know, you can abruptly get there if you're not paying attention, but I am a big fan of letting the fever take place. In fact, and you know, this as a physician, I knew I was in a bad place when I was in my thirties, when I could no longer mount a fever. I couldn't even get one. I was so sickly. And so, you know, the day I got a fever back, I was like, yes, <laughs> My vitality has returned. This is such a great transition because what I have people ask me all the time, they're, they're like, like, okay, Dr. Jill, you know I have chronic Lyme disease and I've had a mold exposure and I have mast cell activation. I have all these things. What's my risk of getting COVID-19 and how will I, you know, or viruses in general, and how will I be affected? Will I get really sick? Now, number one, I will, claim, I will say very clearly, we don't know for sure. Um, but I've been following this enough and looking at the system that the thing you mentioned, what I see in people, one is an overactive system where they have massive cytokine response already. And this is classic with endotoxemia, which is common to diabetes and heart disease and obesity and um, mood disorders, sleep disorders. This kind of cytokine response is already primed in those disorders. And it's no surprise, those are the diseases that we see a higher mortality rate with with the coronavirus or any sort of uh, RNA type of virus. Now, what's interesting though, is I see these people that again, I mentioned Lyme and mold and other things. Often they'll tell me, you know, I'm really sick with pain and inflammation and fatigue, but I never get a cold or flu. I don't get sick, right? And that's kind of what you were saying. And I'd love your opinion if you agree with me or not here. Those people who say I never get sick, what they're saying is they, they don't have the immune response to mount to a viral, inf sorry, infection. So basically when their body gets affected by a virus, the times where they feel flu-like, feverish, malaise, fatigue, um, that's the body's own cytokine response to the virus. And if they're missing that because their immune system is so weak, that's the response that's also creating damage in many of these patients who get sick. So they're actually potentially more protected because their cytokine response is not active. Would you agree um, with that? Yeah, no, I agree with you. I, I do. I, I think that that is a really interesting way to look at it. And I think that sometimes we, um, we take for granted our ability to fight infections because we don't really, it, those, that immune decline coming from someone who it happened to, you know, personally, like it's such a slow descent that you don't really notice it until one day you're like, 
you go from being the person who get, catches all the colds to the person who doesn't even get sick anymore, but you really can't get out of bed because you're completely yes. exhausted because you burned out your immune system. So. Yes. Yeah, because it's not a win-win. It's like you, you maybe don't get the colds or flus. And again, what I see all the time is people who tell me, well, I haven't got sick for 10 years. And they're so proud of that fact. And then as we treat them, they're like, oh my gosh, last year I got two, two colds and a flu. And they're like, is, is everything okay? I'm like, yeah, that's actually like you mentioned, your immune system's waking up and that's way more healthy than to have that blunted response. So yeah, it's we, a very mixed bag, right? Yeah, um, we want somewhere in the middle. Right, right. <laughs> Prolotherapy, which again is like you said, kind of a lost art. I've known about that for years and had some practitioners that do it very well. I don't do it, so I'd send them to someone like you who did. And then now what's so popular is PRP and stem cell. Mm -hmm. And again, the cost goes up. I think the efficacy may go up, but I totally agree. Starting with the simplest, is that typically what you'd recommend or teach? Is starting with simple and then going up if needed, if no response? That is what I teach because for various reasons. One is when you come into the body with a needle of any sort, even if it's just an acupuncture needle or your, whatever substance you're delivering, um, it wakes the body up, it primes the stem cells in the area, but it also quiets down those pain receptors. All those little C fibers that are just around the joint are so angry most of the time. And I, I, I tell patients like, Yes, your MRI looks terrible, but your joint's just really angry and we have to calm it down. If you come in with some dextrose, dextrose actually sits on a, uh, the TRIP-B1 receptor and shuts off pain and calms things down really beautifully. So then you can come back in with some bigger guns and it's not as traumatizing of an experiment. You've probably had patients who went and got PRP and stem cells and had tremendous flares and, and you know, they have PTSD from it. They don't want to go back and get treated again because it was so incredibly painful. Even just the needle touching down yeah. those angry tissues is so painful sometimes. And so if I can get a patient to agree to prolotherapy first, it's always better. We clean it up. We clean up the area. We calm it down. We centralize the pain. Then I can get in there more specifically with those more expensive syringes and make sure that I hit the pain generators instead of like this big enigma of pain that's all over their joint. Oh gosh, Dr. Tina, this makes so much sense. And I didn't understand that because um, I do have people, like you said, that get, they go straight for the big gun. I want stem cells and they do not have a good experience all the time. Depends on what hands they are in. But I've always wondered like of someone who has maybe like they've had a recent toxic mold exposure or they still have chronic inflammation. And what I see from my perspective is that those infections and toxins tend to go to the weakest link. So if that patient has old um, damage from an auto accident in their neck, mm -hmm or lumbar degeneration. Um, my, for example, 10 or 15 years ago, I had really bad mold and fungal illness. And I remember flying back and forth from Colorado when I moved and I was in so much pain. I remember one particular flight back, I needed a wheelchair to get to my plane. Like that's, uh, I mean, I'm running, hiking now, no problem at all. And if you look at my MRI, it looks horrendous. And you <laughs> say you need surgery or you need something. I'm fine. I have no pain, right? But back then I had such a burden of infection and toxic, toxic inflammation. I was, I literally couldn't walk and I have high pain tolerance, but that showed me that there's a couple of things playing into here. It's not just your structural deficits and your MRI findings, but it's on top of that, the inflammation. So say I was in that really inflammatory state. Um, I was always worried and I'd love your opinion because you're the expert here. Could you take someone like that in massive inflammation and use PRP to calm it down? Or would you say calm down the toxic mold exposure first for a few months and then do PRP or prolotherapy? Like, is there any risk of someone super inflamed and making it worse if you don't take care of that inflammation first a little bit? That's a great question. And I think so. Uh, the reason being is if I, and this is the exact words I would use with patients, if I take that hot mess of inflamed blood and concentrate it down or that hot mess yeah. of inflamed adipose tissue and extract it and concentrate it down and shoot it into that hot mess of an inflamed joint, yeah. we're going to have a nightmare on our hands. And You're like adding be, cytokines to it, right? From the Yes. <laughs> it's a nightmare. It's, it's weeks and weeks of misery post-injection for those patients. The thing that I like to do is do the prolotherapy. It will buy them time. It will calm things down so they can get moving again. Because as you and I know, we and your listeners know, you can't get moving if you're feeling horrific. And you can't get over that mold toxicity if you're chronically um, sort of stagnant, right? Like if you're just not getting moving, you can't really overcome these infections, I believe. I firmly believe in like movement yeah. as medicine and sweating it out, and, you know, getting things rolling. So I do the prolo to prime them, but it gives them, it buys them time. And then we can get to work on that chronic inflammatory, whatever the condition is, whatever the stealth infections are, we can work those out in the meantime. And then they've earned the PRP or they've earned the stem cells and then it works. 
versus it not working and then the doctor blaming the patient when really the doctor did the wrong thing in the first place, in my opinion. Gosh, oh, you, I just love talking to you. <laughs> I've had this question forever and I've even had a recommendation to get PRP and stem cells. Now I'm pretty good, so it probably wouldn't hurt me. I'm not inflamed like I used to be, but I always have this catch of like, gosh, I want to make sure I'm not going in super inflamed because I have an intuitive sense that wouldn't be a good idea. But you're actually saying like prolotherapy might be okay in that case because that'll still calm things down. That'll actually calm down that initial Oh, it should. And it really depends. You know, I'm an autoimmune girl myself and I recently just treated my own hip with very low concentration of dextrose and I still flared. I mean, I was shocked at how bad I flared. Um, but stress has been high. Maybe my diet wasn't as ideal as it could be. There's various factors, right? That would, that creates that low grade inflammation in the body. So it's a real crapshoot, I think with everyone, but I think the elegant thing to do is to eat well with any therapy, as you know, is to ease in. I like to go slow and low with any therapy that I'm doing with a patient so that I don't slam them into a wall. I'd rather nudge them into wellness. Yeah. Gosh, so. that's great. And um, we mentioned in the beginning, but I still feel like it might be harder to find qualified people who really know what they're doing as well. Do you see that as an issue where people are advertising, I know how to do this, and they really maybe don't have the skill set? Yes. And I can give you a link of doctors I've trained personally, but yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a lot, lo we're losing it as an art form because practitioners also make a lot more money doing the bigger procedures. And so they don't see utility in it, or maybe they're not strong in their palpation and anatomy skills, and they're good at injecting under ultrasound only, yeah. which I, that's fine. That's a great skill set to have, but you miss a whole lot of information when you don't know how to work with these very well. So uh, I, I agree. Not, yeah. not to diss anyone. I'm not trying to, you yeah. know, I'm not trying to uh, disrespect anyone. I just, there is a, there's a lot of information, you know, when we don't know what we don't know yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. Totally agree. Well, we'll be sure in the, uh, this Facebook live and then on the recording on YouTube, I'll make sure and get whatever links for your website for practitioners. So if you're listening now, we'll make sure and have those resources available um, so that you can click on that and see who you can trust. Um, so let's shift gears because lately, the last several years, and you're in Portland, Oregon, right? Mm -hmm. And how long have you been in Portland? Gosh, most, half my life. Well, I, I spent till I was 14 in California and then Oregon since I was a teenager. <laughs> so yeah, I'm a Portland like, girl. Kind of like Boulder. I mean, there's lots of practitioners. There's lots of great coffee. <laughs> so, yeah, we need um, it. Yeah. So let's shift now. Of course, we have uh, clients, patients, all kinds of people listening. But I know on my site with what I do, I have a lot of practitioners listening. So let's talk a little bit to them and then even to the lay person who maybe has a business online. And so let's shift to what you're doing now with online presence. First of all, talk about how the shift in the last several months with the pandemic has affected you and your, your um, clients. Because to me, it seems like perfect time for yeah. someone like you to come to the forefront because all of a sudden we don't have as much in-person access. My patient load went from probably 30% online to what, pretty much 100%. Now I see maybe one patient in per day. But um, so it's really shifted and there really are differences in how we come across online. I'd love to hear you just talk a little bit about that, like the transition and why it's so important and then some of the things they use to help people. Sure. Well, I think that every business, if they don't get hip to the idea that there has to be some digital and online presence in their marketing strategies, they're going to be, go the way of the dinosaurs. Yeah. Um, I just think it's the way that it is. And something that I teach that's really simple for any business is that, especially in the health space, we know Google is censoring and we know that censorship is real among some of these platforms. And so one way to get around that, that I teach is to saturate the Google search engine by having your presence everywhere. If you've got a little bit of something, it's not about becoming an influencer by any means. It's about just having a strong um, presence in a variety of places, having content out there, you do an excellent job of this blog posts, books, you know, just having something for people to sort of binge watch you, if you will. Yeah. And that way, when they put your name into a Google search engine, up comes a variety of things. There's written content, there's audio, there's video, you're, you're on Instagram, you're on Facebook, you know, you have a strong presence here, I have a strong presence on Instagram. It, it kind of depends on where your ideal client is sitting. But that's the name of the game and it doesn't have to be a full-time job but it really should be something tangible and then to complement that i encourage everybody to really utilize the power of having building and using an email list and getting your clients to know like and trust you because people are way more apt to come spend money with you and it's going to get harder as this world you know i do believe there's going to be a, some semblance of a second wave here and i think as more and more things are digital 
people have to stand out in the crowd. It's just you being on some, not you, but you know, the general practitioner being on an insurance panel is not going to be enough anymore. And we don't want people judging us simply by like, oh, she had a pretty picture. So I decided to go see her, right? We, we can't help the people that we need to help if we don't tell them how to find us. And so that's really kind of the essence of what I teach is just really basic stuff. It takes some time, but none of it's complicated or hard or high level. It's just a matter of being comfortable, putting yourself out there and doing it consistently. Gosh, I love that because it really <laughs> makes it very simple. And it's funny from, I heard a few words that were real important when you said that, because for me, I've never wanted, I always joke to my staff. I'm like, gosh, guys, if I could be at home with my puppies and kind of like live my life, read my book, I never desired to be a public figure. I never desired to be out there. But what I do have very deep within my heart is I want to impact and influence people in a positive way and mostly inspire. So I love those words, impact, inspire, influence, and not for any personal gain. But what happens is as you become trustworthy and like all of the products I sell and the things that I do, it literally comes from, oh my gosh, I bought this air filter. It's working for me. It changed my life after mold. And so, hey, you know, if you want one, I, I'll get a deal with a dealer and share it with you. And I love that I come from that place because like most of my patients and clients and stuff know it's very trustworthy there's never like oh my gosh let me find the next thing that'll make money it's like what's yes. helped me in my journey and how can I just come across authentically and then for me the platform it's interesting because again I I would prefer to remain um anonymous I don't really want to be in the public eye but as we talked about lecturing to professionals or teaching patients or making an influence I do want to impact people's lives I want to help them make change that's positive and what's beautiful is when you have that kind of a motive beautiful things happen because they I mean your clients your people watching us now I think they know me I'm not here to sell you anything I don't even care if you buy from me but if if I am trustworthy and I earn your trust then you know what I say and anything that I mention um, it comes from a right place. And it's so fun to come from that place because magic happens. Like, yeah, sometimes we sell stuff on the store, we, but it's not about that. And, and right. uh, so that impact and inspiration. And I love what you're doing because you're helping practitioners actually become influencers in their space and make a difference. But you can't, if you aren't online, if no one can find you, right, then you can't do what you love to do, which is make a difference. That's it. That's 100% it. You know, my mentor passed away, Dr. Rick Marinelli, who I mentioned, he passed away in 2013. And he was such a huge influence on my profession. And he had always always ahead of the pace with, huh? um, you know, he always had the latest gadget and technology. And when he passed away, his website disappeared. And so did all of his legacy. It was just cr incredible how quickly he seemed to be erased from, yeah. from anyone's memory. I mean, not the people who knew him, but Moving forward, a lot of the young NDs don't even know who he is unless I tell them. And that got me going. And I thought it was the same thing. I started writing a Google document to my daughter in case anything happened to me. I wanted her to know how to like hack her system. Like these are the things you need to know. And as I was writing it, I was like, I think the whole world needs to know this. And so I just started putting content out there similarly just to be of service, yeah. you know, and people thank me all the time. And I'm like, I'm just literally on this planet to tell you the truth as I know yeah. it. Like and I, I meet, my voice comes through social media platforms. Yeah. And that's my why. It's not about me. It's bigger than me. It's about right. his legacy too. It's about the profession. But like people are being lied to and they need to know the truth is how I feel. And so uh, that's my job here. Right. And I, I hope that it impacts millions of lives. I love that. Now you just brought up something so important now. What I'm seeing with the world of artificial intelligence and the way that manipulation of videos and feed, if you're listening out there and you believe what's on your news or your Facebook feed or the videos you see, the truth is videos can be manipulated. People can be made to say things that aren't really true. Um, it, it memes, there's so much of this can be manipulate, manipulate, manipulated. <laughs> <laughs> yes. um, and even more than that, our medias, our um, news press, and even the people who run our social media, they have studied psychological, neuro-linguistic programming, the things that get you to buy or change behaviors. And I just want to be one of those voices that remains that's really authentic, just like you. I hear that coming through. Um, and granted, I, uh, I don't always say everything perfectly, but what I do know is we need more voices out there that are coming truthfully from the heart because there's such a big amount of these things that are um, manipulative. That's mm -hmm. bottom line. And it's getting worse and worse. So the only way to fight that is to bring the voices of truth and to have them out there. And But I'd love to hear, have you seen any of the, I've seen a few of the 
apps and the technology that's coming out to whether it's um, photoshopping photos has gone to a whole new level but even more so video and stuff how do people trust what they're hearing anymore that's hard I know it's crazy I think about it with my daughter she's 20 and I was just looking at how um, you know I remember being a teenager in the 90s and in the early, early nineties and how, you know, everybody was so thin and I did not know Photoshop existed. And when I found out about Photoshop and I realized what they had been doing to my young brain, I was so mad. I could not believe that they were Photoshopping these girls to have like the tiniest thighs and the tiniest legs. And granted, everybody was super skinny then anyway, just by fashion, but um, it's just gotten so morphed and so out of control. And I don't know how young people even navigate it really i think they just know i when i talk to my daughter and her friends they're like oh we think everything's fake they actually just don't even assume anything is possibly real which that's is good amazing. actually right because I, that's yeah. what I, the thing I do. i'm like oh my gosh that's amazing i'm like oh that's from whatever the app snapchat i don't even know these but but you obviously you can create these big eyes and lashes and things yes like, yes yeah, so <laughs> weird i didn't know that existed for years and one of my friends who's much younger than me she's like you do know about the instagram filters right and i was like what <laughs> what an amazing but i'm always the first to tell people when they say you look amazing i'm like that was a filter you know yeah, like, yeah exactly I'm, right? <laughs> I'm 46 years old i have wrinkles i am you know like we, we, we are going to use filter sometimes but yeah it's crazy i do think though um i just want to go back to something you said because you make such a good point and that was kind of where i was getting with with the clients that i coach and with my thinking of my mentor's legacy there's so many brilliant physicians and there's so many brilliant healers out there in the world. And I'm so scared that they're going to die with their unique, um, their unique protocols and their unique way of thinking. And I think I, I'm afraid it's going to die with them. So any of them that have the inkling to step up and step into the online space, it's such a beautiful forum for that because you can immortalize your, your protocols and your thought processes. And even if you don't think they're unique and, and we're so humble as practitioners, we never want to like brag ourselves up. But I do think that we're losing um, some really good common sense in medicine. I'm excited to see functional medicine taking off the way it has because I'm seeing more doctors come. I, say, I always say, welcome to the dark side, but yeah. really <laughs> like, I, you know? <laughs> like welcome to our way of thinking because we need more of that. Uh, going back again, the, the truth, you know, do more doctors telling their patients the truth and helping them get through what they need to without just throwing pills at them and and to the doctor's defense, nobody wants to do that. That's just the model that allopathic medicine has come to. So anyway, it's exciting to see more doctors following the path of, of either naturopathic or functional medicine and even health coaches, you know, people stepping up and then stepping into the online ring. Yeah. I, I, I love it, that you're helping them to get their message out because I just heard recently the best ideas in the world are in the cemetery. Like you said, basically they've died with the, the brilliance of the people who had them and never got them out. So I think that's such a tragedy when the, those things aren't out. And what's funny, the other thing you said is we're, we're humble and granted, I hope that's true, but more important when something is a natural gift to you, or to, maybe it's you helping this online space, maybe it's me solving the complex medical issue. Um, for me, this piece that I'm gifted in, it's so natural, it doesn't feel like a gift, right? And same with you, for you encouraging people or helping people, whatever our gifts are, and for you listening out there too, if you are someone who cuts hair or is a homemaker or is a mother or a teacher or an entrepreneur, whatever your gift is, it feels just like, oh, this is nothing because it's so easy for me to do. That's your gift. Mm -hmm. That's your gift actually. And so it's hard for most people to talk about it or to feel like it's anything special because when it is your gift, it's so easy for you to do, right? Yeah, it is. And I think that I do think as a human being on this planet, I'm always trying to be a better citizen. And I think that it is I think that it, we owe it to the world to get those gifts out. I really feel strongly about that. I was just talking to my boyfriend who is a, he's a millwright and he's an electrician and he can literally build or fix anything. Wow. And I mean, everything's so easy for him. And I said, you, you have no idea how these common sense skills are gone from society. Yeah. Like people don't know how to change a tire anymore. They don't know how to change their oil. Just even having a YouTube channel of like how to do basic things <laughs> around the house with basic tools would be a valuable Thing to have out there, you know, and it would bring a lot of people joy. And he was like, no, it's not that big of a deal. Anyone can do this. And 
that just goes back to what you were saying, you know, yes. whatever your superpower <laughs> is. <laughs> yeah, I'd be like, uh, I don't know how to fix that. <laughs> I have no idea around the house. I can fix people, not things, not my kids. <laughs> right. so, totally. Oh my gosh, this is so fun. And all of a sudden we are almost out of time. Um, let's leave people, what kind of, um, first of all, we were just talking before we got on here that this last week, gosh, if you're listening, share in the space here, but ha- if you had the most crazy week of your life last week, I think so many people had, like there were breakups, there were, like for me, there was office things that changed that were really dramatic. And um, I heard other people uh, just, you know, loss of loved ones. There's so much going on right now, obviously in the world. And so there's suffering going on there. And um, so let's leave people with what would be um, some word of wisdom or piece of hope or any encouragement that you could leave our listeners with today. You know what I've been thinking about a lot lately is, um, and it, it's just, it's, I love movement. Movement always snaps me out of whatever state I'm in. And I love, I just love the idea of once a day in the middle of all of this craziness to just put on a favorite song and dance, just dance your ass off <laughs> and just bring it. some joy in with some music. Music will reset your mindset really quickly and movement will too. And I think the combo of the two, and I always prefer, I've been listening to a lot of music from when I was like 17, 18, 19 years old, just because those were good memories. So that's my bit of advice is find something that is a really healthy distraction. If, if only for a few minutes a day, just to kind of get out of the craziness, to get, put the phone down, turn the social media off and go get some movement with some music. I love that. It, <laughs> so I, this is not ironic because I'm sure it was, but so Saturday I had had this incredibly stressful, crazy week, one of the most stressful of my life. And on Saturday, I had some colleagues that were meeting for, um, you know, a mastermind kind of mind share meeting ideas. And I wanted to join them. I couldn't. And I was at home and I put on some music and I've never done this, Tina, but I started <laughs> dancing and I was like, I'm going to record them and send them this. And I mean, I'm not that person. Like I would maybe in my shower a little bit, sing or dance, but not public. So I did this little video of me Aww. doing the stupidest, silliest dance, but it made me so happy. It literally the joy. And I shared it. And I think most of my colleagues and friends, I have a few close friends I shared it with, they were laughing so hard. And it just was like this beautiful joy. I love that you say that. So hey, everybody listening, put on some music, dance. You don't even have to do a video. You can do it for yourself. Yes. But um, I might if I get the courage and you're here on Facebook, stay tuned because you might get to see a sneak peek of that. I'm going to. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> so That's I love great. that. Though. Awesome. Yeah. Music can really change. Well, thank you so much for joining me. Um, where can people find you on social media? Yeah. So you can find me at Dr. Tina on Instagram. I'm usually over there more than I am on Facebook right now. So that's probably the best place to go. Um, And then drtina.com is my website. And I have a free book there if people want to download that and check it out. And uh, that's it right now. Very cool. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Um, Hang on a minute after we get off and we will chat. And thank you all for joining us today. Please share and we'll see you again next time.